This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a sirah to Nabawiyah, the prophetic biography. Inshallah today, uh, or rather in the previous session, we started off uh, with the sixth year of the Prophet wasallam's residence in the city of Medina, the sixth year of Hijrah. And we talked about uh, one of the initial events in the sixth year of Hijrah, which was the incident of Banu Lihyan. Today, inshallah, we'll be talking about uh, one of the major events of the sixth year of Hijrah, there are a couple of major events, inshallah, that we'll be talking about, but one of them is known as the Ghazwa of Banil Mustalaq, Mustaliq. So the campaign of Banul Mustaliq. This incident uh, itself is very, very notable uh, for a couple of things that occurred during the course of this particular incident that we'll be talking about, inshallah. We'll talk about the incident itself, but what is very, very notable about this particular event is, as, as, as I mentioned before, there were a couple of different uh, things that occurred, both during and in the aftermath of the event, that are very important in Islamic history, and were actually a means to the revelation of the Qur'an in a couple of very important places. So we'll start off by first understanding what exactly this particular event was. So it's mentioned that this event occurred in the month of Sha'ban, in the sixth year of the Prophet Wasallam's residence in Medina, the sixth year of Hijrah. So it is in the second half of the year. This incident, as I mentioned, is called the event or the campaign of Banu Mustaliq. It is also referred to as Ghazwatul Muraysir. Al Muraysir. It's called so because of the place, and Banu Mustaliq is the name of the people that were involved in this particular event or campaign. So, in this particular event, the Prophet ﷺ in the month of Sha'ban traveled with about 700 Sahaba. Um, to a place that is um, about two nights of a journey uh, away from the city of Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, or the Prophet ﷺ had placed Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala anhu in charge in the city of Medina while he was gone. The reason why this entire event or campaign takes place is the Prophet ﷺ is informed of the fact that the people of Banul Mustaliq are gathering together and amassing an army against the Muslims and against the city of Medina. The Prophet ﷺ and the leader of this, of these people and the individual responsible for the forming of this army to go and attack the Muslims in Medina, his name was Al-Harith ibn Abi Dirar. Now the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard about the fact that they are gathering together, the Prophet ﷺ decided to, um, you know, preempt their attack on the city of Medina, and the Prophet ﷺ marched out with 700 Sahaba to go and meet them and try to prevent their attack on the city of Medina. They ended up meeting at a body, uh, an area where there's some water, a stream that is called Al-Muraysir. Hence, it's also known by that particular name as well. 
The Prophet wasallam. these people, uh, of Banu Mustaliq, they were allies of Banu Mudlaj. When the Prophet wasallam arrived there and they were about to go out into the battlefield and meet off with these people, the Prophet wasallam gave the flag of the Muhajirun to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he gave the flag of the Ansar to Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, or excuse me, Sa'ad bin Ubadah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then he asked Abu uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu to um, go out and make an announcement to these people of Banu al-Mustaliq. And the announcement was, La ilaha illallah, there is no one worthy of worship except for Allah. Tamna'u biha anfusakum wa amwalakum. You can protect your lives, you can protect your property by accepting this fact and by accepting Islam. These people, Fa'abo, as we know from history, these people ended up rejecting or denying, turning down the offer. And they actually responded back to this uh, call to Islam that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was making on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu They responded to it by launching arrows. At that time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, commanded the Sahaba to march forward and attack, and they all marched forward. And the narration, the books of history, they tell us, Ibn Ishaq, Waqidi, and others, they tell us that only one Muslim was killed in the battle. And that too has a story behind it that I will come to in just a minute. Uh, about 10 of the enemy, 10 of Banu Mustaliq were killed. And then at that point in time, Banu Mustaliq, they were defeated. And then the Muslims basically uh, took over. So as far as the story of the one Muslim that was killed, his name was Hisham bin Subaba. Hisham bin Subaba was his name. So he was actually killed accidentally by one of the Ansar, one of the Muslims. So the only Muslim that was killed was killed accidentally by the Muslims by basically a stray arrow, what they call friendly fire. And it was purely incidental, it was completely an accident, it was not deliberately done at all. The Prophet ﷺ investigated the situation and felt very comfortable and felt very content that this was purely an accident. However, this individual, Hisham bin Subaba, he was from Mecca. He was from Mecca, he was a muhajir. So his brother, whose name is Miqyas ibn Subaba, he, when he heard about the death of his brother in this incident, he came from Mecca to Medina after the Muslims had gotten back to Medina. He came from Mecca to Medina and told the Prophet wasallam that my brother was killed, he's a member of our family, and fine, he was accidentally killed, but blood money is due in these situations. The Prophet wasallam said absolutely, and he completely obliged, and the Prophet wasallam paid him the blood money which was a significant amount of money. The Prophet ﷺ very willingly, immediately gave it to him. However, the problem was that this individual, Miqyas ibn Subaba, when he came to Medina and asked for the blood money, he basically feigned. He told the Prophet ﷺ that I have become a Muslim, uh, and I'm here to get the blood money for my brother. And the Prophet ﷺ gave it to him. After getting the blood money, he stayed for a little while. He found the Ansari who was responsible for the stray arrow that had ended up killing his brother. He went and he murdered him. After getting the blood money, he murdered him. And then, you know, basically disclosed the fact that he was never a Muslim all along. Uh, or that he had now rejected Islam either way. And then he ended up going back to the city of Mecca. So he con- he basically conducted this treachery and this lie uh, against the Prophet ﷺ, against the Muslims. And in fact had used his own brother's death as just a way to basically attain the money. And the Prophet ﷺ would eventually deal with him later at the f- conquest of Mecca at Fathu Mecca, which we'll talk about at that time. So one of the incidents... So as we talked about that, you know, the event, uh, the, the, the battle itself was lar- largely uneventful, aside from this one very tragic situation. But there, as I mentioned before, that there were other things that transpired on this journey itself that are very notable from an Islamic perspective. So the first notable thing, and the main thing that we'll talk about today, there's about three or four major things that occur on this journey overall, and we'll talk about them insha'Allah. The first thing that we'll talk about, and that'll be what we'll focus on here today, is that there was a little bit of an incident. 
Um, and there's a couple of different reports about it, but generally speaking, what Ibn Ishaq relates is that while they were all traveling on this journey, they stopped at a watering hole. They stopped at a watering hole, kind of like a rest stop. There was a well or some source of water. So obviously being travelers, you know, they come to the watering hole, they get some water to wash themselves up, drink water, give water to their animal or ride. And so they're doing all of this. And there was a muhajir by the name of Jahja ibn Mas'ud. Jahja ibn Mas'ud, he was a muhajir. Then there was another Medinan Muslim, an Ansari. So this was the Muhajir, he was from outside of Medina. He was actually from Banu Ghifar, but he was a Muhajir. He had uh, migrated to the city of Medina. Then there was a local Medinan Muslim, an Ansari. His name was Sinan ibn Wabar al-Juhani. Sinan. So Jahja and Sinan, Muhajir and Ansari, they were there at the watering hole trying to get to the water, and you know, maybe one kind of accidentally elbowed the other, and the other kind of pushed him off, and he said, why are you pushing me? And there was a little bit of a back and forth. They're traveling, you know, they, it's a very it's very difficult to travel, they're probably tired and fatigued and hungry and sleepy, and, and thirsty and all these different things. And so naturally there was a little bit of a misunderstanding, as is very normal. And in fact, one of the Generations uh, mentions that you know in this kind of little bit of misunderstanding and shoving uh, back and forth between uh, a couple of the Muslims, one Muhajir and one Ansari, some people started to kind of you know started saying that Yal al Ansar. So the Ansari Sinan he started to say Yal al Ansar. Where are the Ansar? Where are the Ansar? Kind of you know when two guys get into a thing, they kind of say where are my buddies at? Where's my posse? Where's my buddies? Right? So he said, Yal al Ansar. In the Muhajir, Jahja, he started to say, Yal al Muhajirin, Yal al Muhajirin. Right? Where are the Muhajirin? Where are the Muhajirin? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the narration says, he heard some of these screams, like people saying these things, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa got extremely upset. And he said, Ma ba'lu da'wal jahiliya. What is this jahili talk? And jahiliya basically refers to the pre-Islamic era. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, what is this jahil talk that I hear? These, this, this type of talk, where people are basically, you know, dividing themselves up into groups and trying to pick fights with one another. What is this nonsense? Da'uha fa innaha muntanna. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Leave this. Stop this. This is ugly. It is hideous." Muntan literally refers to like a rotting corpse or a body. Something that has gone spoiled and rotten and smells terrible. He said, "This is the most disgusting thing. Leave this." And so immediately, of course, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they stopped. And the Prophet sallallahu resolved the situation. However, there was one individual, he was not done. So to understand a little bit of backstory, and I actually talked about this before or earlier, but we talked about it, you know, after the Battle of Uhud, so it's been a little bit of time. So just to refresh our memories, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul. He is known as, historically he's remembered as, the leader of the hypocrites, the munafiqun, the covert enemies of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. So he was a very prominent you know, individual member of his community in Khazraj. And he was basically by default assumed to be the de facto leader of Medina prior to Islam's arrival in the city of Medina. Now once Islam came and eventually the Prophet ﷺ came, then at that particular point, immediately everyone deferred to the Prophet ﷺ. And they made the Prophet ﷺ the focal point of you know, everything in their lives. And so he felt very neglected. And in fact, just to remind you kind of of the you know, continuous, uh, you know, strain and stress that this individual caused in the lives of the Muslims and the Prophet ﷺ as well, was that when the Prophet ﷺ was performing the hijrah, the migration, and he was entering into the city of Medina from Quba, some of the Ansar, uh, As'ad bin Zurara and others basically requested the Prophet ﷺ that if you don't mind going a little bit out of your way, making a slight detour, and stopping at the home of Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, if you just stop there to kind of say hello to him, that I'm coming to your city, and I'm very happy to be here, and look forward to working with you, etc. Then it'll mean a lot to him, and maybe it'll kind of ease a little bit of the, uh, you know, insult that he feels. And he feels a little neglected, it'll give him a little bit of uh, attention. And the Prophet ﷺ obliged. 
Now think, this is Muhammad Rasulullah He doesn't have to go out of his way for anyone. And he obliged and he stopped and Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul basically refused to come out of his house. He said, no, tell him to go. I'll come find him if I need him. So very disrespectful. Then the other thing that it mentions is that because he craved the attention, but of course was not worthy of it, right? The narrations mentioned that one of the things that he used to do was of course Jumu'ah was the major congregation of Muslims every single Friday. So every Friday, the Prophet ﷺ, before he would come and give the khutbah, when he would come and sit down on the mimbar, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, he would actually stand up. He would stand up before the Prophet ﷺ would begin the khutbah, and he kind of basically conducted himself, he behaved as if he was like the MC of the khutbah. Right, the introduction to the khutbah. He would introduce the speaker so to speak. Unnecessary. The Prophet ﷺ was not for any of these formalities. But he just kind of took it upon himself to do that. And look at how much, how patient, how patient the Prophet ﷺ is. He, the Prophet ﷺ basically indulged him, humored him. He just he let him do his thing. Even though the Prophet ﷺ was not fond of these things. So he would come, and he would stand up and he would say, أَيُّهَا nas, O people, هَذَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ بَيْنَ أَذْهُرِكُمْ This is a messenger of God amongst you. أَكْرَمَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِهِ God has honored you by bringing the messenger amongst you. وَأَعَزَّكُمْ بِهِ And God has strengthened you by bring, bringing him to you. فَانْصُرُوهُ وَعَزَّرُوهُ So aid him and respect and support him. وَاسْمَعُوا لَهُ وَأَطِيعُوا And listen to him and obey. Right, he wouldn't take his own advice, but he says, listen to him and obey. And then he would sit down, and then the Prophet ﷺ um, would then basically... Uh, stand up and then do the khutbah. And this was the thing that he did every single Friday, unnecessary formality. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't say anything, and because the Prophet ﷺ didn't say anything, nobody else said anything. Then we know that in the battle of Uhud, he ended up committing something very egregious, publicly. And what he did in the battle of Uhud was, that he took 300 sahaba, uh, excuse me, 300 people. So when the Sahaba were going for the Battle of Uhud, he himself, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, had 300 people with him that he had brought to the army. And about halfway, about a third of the way to Uhud, he then basically turned and left and took his 300 people with him as almost like a protest to the Prophet wasallam. And he publicly did this. And the Prophet wasallam didn't say anything. He'd even bat an eye. He pretended like it never even happened. And they went... And whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed, is what transpired. The Friday after the battle of Uhud, he stood up to do whatever it is that he would do every single Friday, you know, give the introduction to the khutbah. Some of the people, as soon as he got up, some of the people of Khazraj, his own tribesmen, they grabbed him and they basically pulled him down. And they said, Ijlis, sit down, ay adu Allah, O enemy of God. لَسْتَ لِذَٰلِكَ بِأَهْلِ You do not deserve to speak in front of the Messenger of God وَقَدْ صَنَعْتَ مَا صَنَعْتَ You know what you did. And he got so insulted by this, that he started to storm out of the masjid. فَخَرَجَ يَتَخَطَّ رِقَابَ النَّاسِ He started like, you know, pushing, shoving people out of the way, because it's Jumu'ah. And the Sahaba would get there before the khutbah, before the Prophet ﷺ began. So the Jumu'ah, the masjid is full, people lined up, and he started pushing and shoving and stepping over people, and, and just tore through the masjid, upset and angry. When he got to the door, some people they, who were at the masjid, uh, at the door of the masjid, some, some of the Ansar, they said, Waylak. Malaka, what, what, what's going on? Why are you like shoving people over and plowing through the saf and like leaving the masjid in a rage and storming out of the masjid? Why are you doing this? And he said, "Aqumtu ushaddidu amrahu." I only stood up to support him. فَوَثَبَ عَلَيْكَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ أَصْحَابِهِ يَزِرْبُونَنِي وَيُعَنِّفُونَنِي. But a bunch of these people. They started yelling at me and they shoved me and they pulled me and they said, I can't say it. As if I was saying something inappropriate. I was just gonna support him. I was just gonna say something nice about him. And they said, Waylak. They said, You know exactly what you did. Don't come around here acting like, oh, I don't know why people are upset at me. Why are people angry at me? You know exactly what you did. And they said, Irja, what you're supposed to do in this situation. What you're supposed to do in this situation is irja, irja, go back, 
يَسْتَغْفِرُ لَكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. And ask the messenger for forgiveness. And ask Allah for forgiveness. And ask the messenger to pray to Allah on your behalf that Allah forgives you. And have a clean slate and start over again. Sensible advice. فَقَالَ وَاللَّهِ مَا أَبْتَغِيَ يَسْتَغْفِرَ لِي He says, I swear to God, I would never go to him and ask him to pray for me. About the Prophet ﷺ. So this is who this man is. So that we, we're clear and we understand. So now that this little situation occurs between an Ansari and a Muhajir, and it started to get out of control, and the Prophet ﷺ shut it down right away. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, you know, troublemaker, instigator, he's looking for something. You know, he can smell, he can, he can smell trouble. Or at least the potential for trouble. He feels like he missed out on an opportunity to further instigate the situation. So he's sitting with a bunch of his cronies, a bunch of his people, and he says, and, and amongst them, kind of on the side of them, is a young man, right, who's just sitting off to the side, or some narrations say that he was lying down and sleeping, or he looked like he was sleeping, but he was lying in a corner. And his, the young man's name is Zayd ibn Arqam. Zayd ibn Arqam. And he was a very young man, so also he didn't really pay too much attention, like, oh, what's this boy? And he started to say, Awaqat fa'aluha, is that really what happened? And then he started talking. And he says, Waqad na faruna wa katharuna fi biladina. He says, they've come and they've overrun our town. Wallahi ma uduna wa jalabib kuresha dihi illa kama kala al awal sam min kalbak ya kulk. Very bad. He says that, you know, these, these vagabonds, he refers to the people of Quraysh, the muhajirun as jalabib, which basically means people kind of wrapped up in a blanket, like homeless people. He says these homeless people of Quraysh, you know what they are? They are what, you know, people used to say, fatten up your dog, and then one day he'll bite you. Feed your dog, take care of the dog, and then one day he'll turn around and bite you. Like ungrateful. That's what these people are. And then he says, لَإِن رَجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيُخْرِجَنَا لَعَزُ مِنَ الْأَذَلِ That, he says, I swear to God, when we get back to Medina, the real true keepers of Medina will kick out these humiliated homeless people. And then he continues to go on, and he says, هَذَا مَا فَعَلْتُمْ بِأَنفُسِكُمْ He says, you know what? He says to some of his like people, who are from Medina, he says, you, y'all did this to yourselves. أَحْلَلْتُمْ بِبِلَادِكُمْ دَا أَحْلَلْتُمُوهُمْ بِبِلَادِكُمْ You people let them into your home. وَقَاسَمْتُمُوهُمْ أَمْوَالَكُمْ You gave them your money. أَمَا وَاللَّهِ لَوْ أَمْسَكْتُمْ عَنْهُمْ مَا بِأَيْدِكُمْ لَتَحَوَّلُوا إِلَى غَيْرِ دَارِكُمْ That if you hadn't given them, and fed them, and given them shelter, and homes, and places to live, they would have gone back, they would have gone somewhere else. So Zayd bin Arqam is listening to all of this, this young man. After he hears all of this, he goes to the Prophet ﷺ, this is after the battle is over. And Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is sitting with the Prophet ﷺ, and he tells the Prophet ﷺ everything, that listen, I was there, and Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, he said this, 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 this. I thought you should know, Messenger of God. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is very, very angry. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that, let's send someone right now to go and kill him. Right? He's a traitor. Disrespectful to the Prophet ﷺ. Backstabber. Let's go finish him now. And the Prophet ﷺ says, فَكَيْفَ يَا عُمَرُ What are you talking about, Umar? What are you talking about? And he says, إِذَا تَحَدَّثَ النَّاسُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدٍ يَقْتُلْ أَصْحَابَهُ He says, what do you think people are gonna say? People will say that, look, Muhammad, he kills his own companions. Muhammad slaughters his own followers. He's a tyrant. People will say these things. People are looking for some fodder. So he says, no. He says, walakin adin bil rahil. He says, no. In fact, it was evening time already. It was evening time. And normally, we've talked about this before, you don't, they didn't used to travel in the evening time. Because it's the middle of the desert, it's out there, right? There's no lights, there's no roads, there's none of that. So you can't really travel at night. So even though it was so out of character to travel during the evening time and nighttime, the Prophet said, immediately go and tell everyone to pack up their stuff and we're leaving now. So they end up going, and Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul 
finds out through his little network that I think the Prophet ﷺ knows what you said about him and about the Muslims and about the Muhajirun. So he comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Ya Rasulullah, he says, Oh Messenger of God, and he starts, you know, taking oaths. Wallahi ma qultu, ma qal. I swear to God, I did not say whatever, you know, this kid has told you. And on and on and on and on. And he keeps going on, swearing to Allah. Like Allah says, يَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ مَا قَالُوا وَلَقَدْ قَالُوا كَلِمَةَ الْكُفْرِ وَكَفَرُوا بَعْدَ إِسْلَامِهِمْ Right, that Allah says that they keep on taking oaths. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, what do their oaths mean? These are people that lie about everything. So he keeps on taking oaths and he says, I swear to God I didn't, I swear I didn't, I swear I didn't. And even some of the Ansar that are there, who are, you know, sincere, well-intentioned, they're trying to reconcile the situation and fix the problem. And they say, Ya Rasulullah, Asa an yukun al ghulam awham fi hadithihi wa lam yahfaz ma qala rajul. He said, Oh Messenger of God, look, one possibility is, he's a young man, he's a boy, maybe he was kind of mistaken in what he heard, and he doesn't really exactly remember the words, and you know, he's kind of mixed up, he's a little confused. And so, hadaban ala ibn Abi Ubay wa dafa'anu, they're trying to reconcile the situation. So the Prophet wasallam said, okay, fine, that's, that's it, don't worry about it, let's just go. And he says, and everyone started moving. And they continued to travel um, and for a very long time. Usaid bin Hudayr, one of the leaders of the Ansar, comes to the Prophet wasallam and he says, Ya Rasulullah, wallahi laqad ruhta fi sa'atin munkara. Oh Messenger of God, you're, tra- you're having us travel at night, this is not optimal. وَمَا كُنْتَ تَرُوحُ فِي مِثْرِيَا Maybe, I just, you know, it's not even that, you know, this is a strategy on your part. I've been on every single campaign with you, and you never travel at night time. The Prophet ﷺ says, وَمَا بَلَغَكْ مَا قَالَ صَاحِبُكُمْ Don't you know what your, what one of the, one of the guys has said? Because Usaid bin Hudayr was from Khazraj. So he's saying, don't you know what your Khazraji guy said? And he said, Ayu sahibi, ayu sahibin ya Which, who said this? And he said, Abdullah bin Ubay. And he says that, you know, Abdullah bin Ubay said, he said, what did he say? And the Prophet ﷺ tells him what he says. And he says, فَأَنْتَ وَاللَّهِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ تُخْرِجُوا إِنْ شِئْتَ O Messenger of God, if you want, we can kick him out of Medina right now. He says, you're gonna kick you out? We'll kick him out right now. وَاللَّهِ هُوَ وَاللَّهِ الذَّلِيلِ وَأَنْتَ الْعَزِيزِ I swear to God, he is humiliated and you are honorable. But then he pleads with the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Urfuk bihi. He says, try to be a little gentle with him. Forgive him, overlook him. He's, he doesn't matter anymore. Nobody listens to him. And he's just angry, he's just upset. And then he kind of relates the whole thing that they were going to basically make him king of Medina. And then when you came, everyone forgot about him. But the Prophet ﷺ said, no problem, and they basically continued to travel all throughout the night, all throughout the morning, until it was like mid-morning time, almost noon time. And now the Sahaba were so tired and fatigued, they'd been walking for like 12 hours straight. And they were very, very tired. And at this point in time, and the sun was bearing down on him, on them, and the Prophet ﷺ finally told them, you can stop. And the narration says, فَوَقَعُوا نِيَامًا They didn't even wait to like set up their tents or anything. Everybody just kind of fell down where they were and just fell asleep. Fatigued, exhausted, tired. And then after resting for a little while, the Prophet ﷺ again told them, let's go, let's keep walking. And he made them walk again for like another 12 hours. Until again, they got so fatigued and tired and he had them stop and everybody fell down, tired, exhausted again, fell immediately asleep. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked about this, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا فَعَلَ ذَلِكَ لِيَشْغَلَ النَّاسَ عَنِ الْحَدِيثِ الَّذِي كَانَ بِالْأَمْسِ The wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ in this was that the Prophet ﷺ had them just pick up and travel and travel and travel until they were ex- extremely fatigued. So as soon as they would stop, they would go to sleep and then wake them up after they got slept for a few hours and then walk and walk and walk and again stop and immediately everyone goes to sleep and again wake up and walk and walk. And the reason why the Prophet ﷺ did that was so that people would not gossip amongst each other. Right? The idle mind, 
devil's workshop. Right? So people are bored, people are sitting around, relaxing, and then people, oh, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he said? Did you hear what happened? Hear? And the Prophet said, no. This is fitna. This is nothing but trouble. This is bad. It's a huge lesson for us in regards to, you know, um, just in life in general, but particularly, particularly if I may, I'll say that this is a profound lesson for especially community work, Islamic work. That a lot of times, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for, you know, generalizing, but I'm more so doing it from internally as a, as somebody who is involved in community work or Islamic work, that sometimes the level of gossip and just he said, she said, that goes on in our community work and Islamic circles is even more than what goes out there in the normal world, in the real world. That People who are basically involved in other types of whatever, you know, initiatives or work or things, right? We sometimes look at them saying like, oh, these people don't get involved in the community or the masjid. But we spend half the time sitting around talking about other people and what's going on with other people. And the biggest cure and the remedy for that is get busy. Look how much work there is to do. How many hungry are there to feed? How many homeless are there to put a shelter over? How many people are there out there to cover and clothe? How many people are out there to go and talk to and communicate with? How many of our youth need mentorship and guidance? How many families are struggling with issues and problems? How many non-Muslim? We're surrounded by a non-Muslim majority. So much da'wah work to be done. There's so much work to do. And the best remedy to curbing this situation where we just sit around calling it a meeting and we're sitting around just talking about other people is get busy, get up and get busy. And the Prophet ﷺ shows us that. That sometimes the last thing we need is to sit down and talk some more. Sometimes we just need to get up and move and do some work. And the Prophet ﷺ remedied this situation. That fine, something un- unfortunate has occurred but rather than everybody sitting around and lamenting it and talking about it, Let's just move. Get everyone busy. Do something productive. And so they basically continue on. And Zayd, uh, Zayd bin Arqam, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, this young sahabi, he basically says that after all of this has hap- had happened, and I brought this report, this information, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa basically it seemed... And again, the Prophet was trying to minimize the fitna, and he, he didn't apparently do anything about it, or at least it seemed like he hadn't done anything about it. Zayd says that some of my, some of my people, they started to, you know, kind of, uh, they started to scold me, or started to kind of like come down on me. Now why did you go and cause this fitna? Why did you go and cause trouble? Did you even hear what you say you heard? How can we believe you? Right? And he said, I started to get a little bit of, you know, flack from some of my people. فَلَامَنِي قَوْمِي وَقَالُوا مَا أَرَدْتَ إِلَى هَذَا Why do, why would you do this? So he said that, فَانْتَلَقْتُ فَنِمْتُ كَثِيبًا حَزِينًا And I went and I kind of laid down in a corner and cried myself to sleep. That, am I a liar in the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ now? Am I a liar? Am I just a troublemaker? Am I just making the life of the Prophet ﷺ more difficult? So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he called for me. The Prophet sallallahu called for me. When I came to him, he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدَ أَنزَلَ عُذْرَكْ وَصَدَّقَكْ God has spoken on your behalf and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has testified on your behalf. That, and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited Surah Al-Munafiqun. And I'll go through... Um, as we always like to do, I'll go through surah, uh, the, the, just a be- brief run through of Surah Al-Munafiqun at the conclusion of the session, um, as kind of a Quranic lesson at the end of it. But just to kind of wrap this particular incident up, um, when the Prophet ﷺ called him and he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has testified on your behalf that you spoke the truth, and then he read Surah Al-Munafiqun, فَقَرَأَ سُورَةَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ Then he says that the Prophet ﷺ kind of grabbed my ear and playfully kind of twisted my ear. He kind of playfully twisted my ear and he says that, هَذَا الَّذِي أَوْفَ اللَّهُ بِأُذُنِهِ 
that God has said that his ear spoke his ear was true. In another narrative, Wafat Udunak, your ears are true. Your ear, good ears is this one on him? He's got good ears on him. Right? To kind of make him feel better. And in fact, you know, the way the Prophet had the ability to make people, you know, feel better about themselves is remarkable. In one of the narrations um, it, it, that Imam at tirmidhi mentions, he actually says that when the Prophet, and he says that I was so sad and so low, and the Prophet ﷺ, you know, kind of grabbed and twisted my ear, and he smiled at me. And I received this good news. He says, فَمَا كَانَ يَسُرُّنِي أَنَّ لِي بِهَا الْخُلْفِ فِي الدُّنْيَا He says, I wish I could have spent the rest of my life just sitting there with the Prophet ﷺ smiling at me, twisting my ear. It was the most amazing moment of my life. And he says that, I... I got, you know, obviously the Prophet said, okay, go now. So he says, I got up and I met Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had seen the Prophet talking to me. He said, ma qala laka, ya, ma qala laka Rasulullah. What did the Prophet say to you? And he said, ma qala li Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The Prophet didn't say anything to me. He just twisted my ear and he laughed at me and he smiled at me. Like that's all he remembered. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, abshir, congratulations. And then, because he understood what had happened. And then he says that I met Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he also said, what was the Prophet ﷺ saying to you? And I told him the same thing. And again, Abu ba- uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he congratulated me. And then in the morning, the Prophet ﷺ gathered all the sahaba together and he recited Surah Al-Munafiqoon to all of the sahaba. Now before I go through Surah Al-Munafiqoon, the story kind of goes on a little bit that basically the sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, they proceeded on to the city of Medina. They were going back home. So they continue on to the city of Medina. What happens at that particular time is that this man, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, he uh, had a son. He had a son by the name of Abdullah as well. So this is Abdullah ibn Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul. Alright, so his son's name was Abdullah. But his son was like a real true Muslim, a sincere Muslim. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, O oh, Messenger of God, what my father has done is terrible. And he says, I'm, I'm still dealing with it, I'm still trying to... And he says that you can, you can go and ask all of my people. And you will say, مَا كَانَ بِهَا مِنْ رَجُلٍ أَبَرَّ بِوَالِدِهِ مِنِّي You will not find a single person in Medina, in Khazraj, amongst the Ansar, who is more respectful of his parents than I am. I have always been respectful of my parents. And I serve my parents. And I honor my parents. But my father has done something horrendous. And I'm still trying to figure it out. And he says something because he's so confused by all of this. He says, oh messenger of God, if the recourse for the repeated aggressions and indiscretions on the part of my father, are that he will be killed, then please tell me that I would rather do it myself than have somebody else who executes my father. And then I have to live the rest of my life seeing someone who I know that this is a person that took my father's life. He's just confused, he's very distraught, he's upset. And so he just comes to the Prophet ﷺ venting to him. And the Prophet ﷺ comforts him. He comforts him and he says, بَلْ نَتَرَفَّقْ بِهِ No, no, don't worry, don't worry son. We're going to be very gentle and very gracious with your father. We will be very gentle and very gracious with him. وَنُحْسِنُ صُحْبَتَهُ مَا بَقِيَ مَعْنَا And we will continue to treat him well. As long as he's with us, which is the Prophet ﷺ guaranteeing that he will not be harmed, he will not be killed. He will live out his life. He will live out his life until whatever Allah has decreed. But we are not going to do anything to him. And as long as he's alive, we will treat him well. This is how we do. And then when they got back to... And, and his son, basically... When they got back to the city of Medina, as they were entering into Medina, the son went ahead, he turned around and he stopped. And as the father was approaching, he stopped his father. He said, stop right there. 
He says that you said you are honorable and the messenger is disgraceful. You know you were wrong. You will take that back. You will say the messenger is honorable and you are the one who are disgraceful for saying that about the Prophet ﷺ. And he, did, and he said that you are not allowed to enter until the Prophet ﷺ gives you permission to enter. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard about this, he said, go and tell him, let his father enter. Don't do that. And at that point in time, he basically moved out of the way and, the Prophet, uh, and then the Prophet ﷺ allowed Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul to come back into the city of Medina. But when he came back to the city of Medina, basically, everybody, even the few people that still just due to tribal or family relations, still treated him somewhat decently, all basically dismissed him. And nobody had any more tolerance for him at all. And when that basically happened, and he was completely just relegated by his own people, the people of Khazraj. The Prophet ﷺ turned to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he said, كَيْفَ تَرَايَا Umar? Do you see? Huh, Umar, do you see? أَمَا وَاللَّهِ لَوْ قَتَلْتُهُ يَوْمَ قُلْتَ لِي أُقْتُلُهُ لَا أَرْعَدَتْ لَهُ آنُفٌ he says, if I would have had him executed, the day when you had suggested to me that we should execute him, I would have created a sympathetic following for him. He would have, it would have turned him into a martyr. He would have become somebody, people would have spun a narrative, spun a story, that he was somebody who was killed by a tyrant. But he said, لَوْ أَمَرْتُهَا الْيَوْمْ بِقَتْلِهِ لَقَتَلَتْهُ But the Prophet ﷺ said, Today though, I'm not going to. I told his son, we will deal with him well. We will leave him be. We'll even be gracious and gentle with him. But today if I told his own family, his own people, to go and execute him, they would execute him. So the Prophet ﷺ tells Umar, teaches him a lesson, you see? And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, قَدْ وَاللَّهِ عَلِمْتُ That day I learned a profound lesson. لَا أَمْرُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ أَعْدَمُ بَرَكَةً مِنْ أَمْرِي That the, the decision and the wisdom and the, the strategy of the Prophet ﷺ is much more blessed than the best plan or strategy that I can come up with. And so this is basically what transpired with uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul, um, you know, on his arrival back into the city of Medina. Now, uh, very briefly, inshallah, uh, what I'd like to do, just because it's an opportunity to kind of see the cohesion between the life of the Prophet ﷺ. How I, I've said this many, many times, that the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the prophetic biography is the backdrop to the book of Allah. And it's very fascinating when you're able to connect the two things together and really understand the Qur'an at a more deeper, profound level. So let's take a look at this surah, Surah Al-Munafiqun, which is surah number 63. It has 11 ayat, 11 verses, so it should not take too long, inshallah. Um, in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَا رَسُولُهُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the hypocrites come to you, O Messenger of Allah, Prophet, and they say that we bear witness that you are the Messenger of Allah, God knows, Allah knows that you truly are His Messenger, and Allah bears witness that the hypocrites are nothing but liars. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, اتَّخَذُوا أَيْمَانَهُمْ جُنَّةً فَصَدُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُمْ سَاءَ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ That they... You, they take all types of oaths as a cover and to bar others, to hold others back from the path of Allah. What they have been doing is nothing but evil. Alright? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, that what they've been doing is truly terrible. Allah goes on to say, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا ثُمَّ كَفَرُوا فَطُبِعَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is all because of the fact that they claim to believe, but then after that really truly disbelieved, and their hearts have been sealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their hearts have been sealed, and they do not really understand the truth of this deen and religion. وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَهُمْ تُعْجِبُكَ أَجَسَامُهُمْ 
وَإِنْ يَقُولُوا تَسْمَعَ لِقَوْلِهِمْ كَأَنَّهُمْ خُشُبٌ مُسَنَّدَةٌ يَحْسَبُونَ كُلَّ صَيْحَةٍ عَلَيْهِمْ هُمُ الْعَدُوُ فَاحْذَرْهُمْ قَاتَلَهُمُ اللَّهُ أَنَّا يُؤْفَكُونَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, oh, when, when you see them, O Prophet, their outward appearance may, you know, impress you. When they speak, you listen to what they say. But they are like propped up pieces of wood. Which means they're like lifeless bodies. They think every cry they hear is against them. I mean, they think that the whole world revolves around them. And they are the enemy. Beware of them that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humullah and na yufakun that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy them, meaning Allah is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with them, that how deluded and confused are these people. Then Allah says, Wa ida qil alahum ta'ala, ya sahfil la kum rasulullahi, lawa ruusahum, wa raitahum ya sudduna wa hum mustakbirun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they turn their heads away in disdain when they are told, come so that the Messenger of Allah may ask forgiveness on your behalf. But you see them walking away arrogantly. سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَسْتَغْفَرْتَ لَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ لَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الْفَاسِقِينَ Allah says that it makes no difference. You can ask forgiveness on their behalf or not ask forgiveness on their behalf. Allah will never forgive them. Because change comes from in here. And they have no intent, no desire to better themselves. Allah will not forgive them. And most definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not guide evil sinful people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, هُمُ الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ لَا تُنْفِقُوا عَلَى مَنْ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ حَتَّى يَنْفَضُّوا وَلِلَّهِ خَزَائِنُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, these are the same people that campaign. They say, do not give your money, do not spend, do not be generous with the people around the Prophet ﷺ. These muhajirun, these people that are moving to your city, coming here, seeking refuge and shelter, don't give them anything. Hatta yanfadu, so that they all leave from here, they all disperse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, that to Allah alone belong the treasures of the heavens and the earth, but these sad, pathetic little people, these munafiqun, they don't grasp this. They don't get it. They don't understand. يَقُولُونَ لَإِن رَجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلِ وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they continue to campaign by saying that once we get back to Medina, the powerful, the mighty, the honorable, the dignified, original residents of the city will kick out all these humiliated, disgraceful vagabonds. We'll kick them out, we'll get rid of them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares, He says, might and glory, power and dignity, respect and authority, belong to Allah and His Messenger and the believers. But once again, these hypocrites, they just don't know any better. They don't get it. They don't know any better. Yeah, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes by reminding us, when you look at people like this, because see, there's a very interesting dynamic in the Qur'an. The Qur'an just doesn't condemn people for the sake of condemning people, meaning that the point of us studying the Qur'an and reading about these types of terrible people is not just that we read about them and say, yeah, munafiqun are bad people, munafiqun are terrible people. One of the profound lessons here, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, is that reading these ayats reflect on the qualities that hypocrites have, and then severely critique yourself, not anyone else. Go and take a long hard look in the mirror, and see if you display, if you exhibit any of the qualities of the hypocrites. إِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَ وَإِذَا تُمِنَ خَانَ وَإِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذِيبَ when they speak, they lie. When they make promises, they break them. When something is entrusted to them, they betray you. They don't come through. Gate, measure yourself, make sure you're good and clear. The Prophet ﷺ said that, هَذِهِ خِصَالٌ nifaq. These are the, the traits, the tell, ta, these are the telling signs of nifaq. Hypocrisy, a corrupted heart. And he said that once they combine all within one person, that person has munafiqan khalisan. That person has become a real hypocrite. His heart is completely polluted. 
But if you start to exhibit some of them, you have started to pick up some of the traits of hypocrisy, work to remedy them immediately. And if I may, and there's two elements to this. The Quran says, إِذَا قَامُوا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ قَامُوا كُسَالَى When they stand to pray, they're lazy, negligent. So there's nifaq that manifests itself in the realm of our relationship with Allah. And then there's a nifaq that manifests itself in how we interact with other people. And we have to constantly be vigilant and careful in both regards. But as I was saying, the surah ends by reminding us, how do you never end up in that situation? How can you avoid completely becoming one of those people, being on the right side of this equation, being amongst the mu'mineen, the people devoted to Allah and His Messenger wasallam. Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُلْهِكُمْ أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, O you who believe, do not let your wealth and your children distract you, meaning your wealth and your property, your material things and your families, distract you from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Qur'an, I'll comment on this, is kind of a side point, a little bit of a tangent, but the Qur'an whenever it says things like this, is not creating a dichotomy, a struggle, uh, 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 an issue between spirituality and family. No, 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 don't mistake that. But it's saying, don't be lazy in your relationship with Allah, and then blame your family for it. Don't use your family as an excuse for being bad in your relationship with Allah. And we all know exactly what that's talking about. When I'm too lazy to come to the masjid, and I'm sitting there watching TV, and it's like, oh, you know the kids, I get home, I gotta be with the kids. No, you're watching television. You spend more time with your phone than you do with your children. And then you know family, family, family. No, no, don't do that. And in fact, a little bit of time, quality time spent with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings more barakah and blessing into the home and into the family life. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, do not let your property, your wealth, your material things and your families distract you from the remembrance of Allah. Those who do so will be the true losers on the day of judgment. وَلَعَكَمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ فَيَقُولَ رَبِّ لَوْ لَا أَخَّرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَدِيبٍ فَأَصَّدَّقَ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And then Allah says that spend from what we have given you. Ajeeb. Alright, Allah says spend. Min means just a little bit of that which we gave you, Allah says. Spend just a little bit of that which we gave you. Before death comes to anyone, each and every single one of you. And the Qur'an has a very unique style of saying that death will come to eat. Ahadakum. Each and every single one of you. And ahadakum by means of that, it also is implying that when death comes, you'll be all alone. That journey to the afterlife, you take completely alone. And then that person will say, My Lord, my Master, Ya Rab, Ya Allah, Please, just give me a little bit of time, Ajalim Qareeb, a little bit of time, so that I can go and give some charity, do some good, and be a good person. Akum mina salihin. But Allah says, وَلَنْ يُؤَخِّرَ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِذَا جَاءَ أَجْلُهَا Allah will not give a second more to any soul when its expiration date comes. When its time arrives. When its time is up. وَاللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly, always aware, fully informed, up to date about each and every single thing that you do. God consciousness. Live a life of remembrance of Allah, spirituality. Prioritize Allah before everything else in your life. Think about the reality that is death and how we all have to leave this world. Spend material things, the things that take up place in your heart, the things that latch on and suck the iman from your heart, those things, pull them away from your heart. You know, one of our teachers, he said something very remarkable, very profound. He said that like a nugget of wisdom. He said, you know, it, it, a lot of times we have these discussions about wealth. Well, money isn't evil, wealth isn't evil. Right? It's, it's what you do with it, so on and so forth. That's true. But what we also have to understand is where do you store it makes a big difference as well. Where do you keep it, it makes a big difference as well. That the Sahaba didn't keep their material, their money in their hearts, they kept it in their hands. So you take it when you need it, and you give it when you need it. 
And it stays right here all the time. They kept it in their back pocket, not their chest pocket. Right? But the mistake that we've made, we kept, we stored money right in here inside our hearts. So the first practice is, remove it from your heart and start keeping your money in your hand. And the way that you do that is you start spending it. Oh, in the first couple of times you spend it? And what's spending? Not this money that you obviously like spare change lying around in your car. Not the money that after you've allocated money for everything else including luxury. Then the hundred dollars you've set aside, inshallah, this is what I'll give to the masjid. No, the money that you have set aside for some of your own indulgences. And the first couple of times you give it, it will hurt. It will hurt. It'll, it'll feel like you're pulling something out of your heart. It'll be painful, really painful. But then you do it a second time, a third time, a tenth time, a hundredth time. And guess what? Money stays right here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a place here. And that's how we can protect our hearts, guard our hearts, polish and shine our hearts, and make them the home of iman. Right? And make sure that nifaq, hypocrisy, that darkness, never enter into our hearts. Alright, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. We'll go ahead and stop here and continue on from here next week inshallah. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.